Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to Finding Me today in the ITV networks here at the Sheraton Hotel in Pretoria as guests of AMAC, the Afro Middle East Centre, where they're discussing a very dynamic concept, and that is between state and civil society, between state and society. And with me, I have an amazing voice, a powerful, powerful intonation of the, many of the problems and the conflict that we faced in South Africa, contextualizing through our history and the role of non-governmental organizations. Fatima Shabodin is a feminist, uh, a civil society activist, and as she said to me earlier, she's in an existential crisis because she's had enough, she's left the NGO sector and is trying to figure out now what to do. Yeah. Fatima, assalamu alaikum, welcome well, and thank you for being here. Wa alaikum salam, it's great to be here. And I think, you know, um, I envy you in a way <laughs> to be able to take that decision to yeah. say no, it's enough, yeah. I need time yeah. out, isn't it? Yeah. Look, I'm committed to the issues, I'm committed to the project of what we want to achieve in the world because the world that we live in is not a friendly one. To most yes. people, it doesn't work, this configuration. Mm -hmm. And so I do think for all my criticisms, I know that NGOs are trying to do something. I just want to figure out a different avenue to make a better contribution to that. I suppose probably that's part of the decolonial dialogue. Absolutely, that, you know, absolutely. Find a new way. Yeah. We don't chuck the baby out of the bathwater, but we improve and no. we find different strategies. No, it? look, we've invested a lot in building that infrastructure. Yeah. The almost 100 year history of INGOs and our continent was built on our backs. And if you ask Africans what we have to show for that history and that investment, there's very little. Wow. But After I'm saying that, years. yeah, but you know, in the context of globalization, mm -hmm. the national borders of our country make very little sense. We have to join in solidarity across borders. Mm -hmm. And so NGOs and INGOs do offer a convenient vehicle. The infrastructure is there, the mechanisms are there. The, the challenge to us is to redefine what these NGOs are, who makes decisions, who sits in there, and what we do with those. So for the benefit of the viewers, an INGO is an international non-governmental It's an international non-governmental organization, and the reason why I shared the reflection of the INGO experience in Africa with our Middle East colleagues is because we've got a longer timeline to reflect on as Africans. Mm -hmm. So we can look back at the system and we can say these are the major fault lines. We can now see it with clarity that hindsight is an exact science, so we can see the things that we did wrong with good intentions often, but we can offer that as a case study to the Middle East where INGOs are a much newer entry into their field, but so that they can learn very critically from what we've experienced and decide how they want to interact with well, INGOs. Yeah, so, yeah, so when you spoke about it, you said it's been a hundred year history and mm. very little to offer, so basically much of it has been negative. Where do you see the greatest pitfalls and, and, and how? How did these INGOs uh, originate? Well, the origins of most NGOs, it's very well-intentioned. People who are in Europe, mostly, who looked at our continent and said, people are hungry, people are suffering, let me do something about it. So certainly we cannot fault people. But the reality is the way in which they responded was as if we did not have agency, as if the money that they were bringing to our continent didn't come from a system of first slavery and then colonialism. And the reality is that in many ways, these INGOs reproduce the systems. In, in as much as we are critical of the system of neoliberalism, the reality is that NGOs exist because neoliberalism is there. Mm -hmm. So it's a very conflicted relationship. We interact with that system to get the resources that we need, and at the same time, we're trying to dismantle it. So you can see the tension there already. Yeah, of course, yeah. It's, it's, it's critical. But yeah. What frightens me is then, it's these individuals who are almost put in a list, mm, looking at mm, Africa, mm, as you said, mm, mm. They, have, uh, they have empowered themselves, they have enriched themselves mm. through the exploitation of Africans, mm -hmm. and then return as if they are philanthropic mm. or empathetic mm -hmm. uh, and offering these donations mm. and charities, and as you say, it removes yeah. the agency, yeah. but it also removes the human dignity. Mm. Yeah, look, I, I think that's a very simplistic narrative that focuses on one end of the spectrum either. So I don't want to take away from INGOs their contribution, which has also been significant, not without contradiction. So part of what I was trying to explain inside is I think that NGOs and INGOs broadly have made a contribution 
NGOs save lives in our country. It saves lives of women on this continent, and we can't take that away. We can theorize about better narratives and INGOs and neoliberalism, but the reality is if people are without food, if a woman suffers violence and an NGO steps into that, we cannot diminish that in terms of that woman's dignity, in terms of that woman's right. So I don't want to diminish all of the contribution, right. but I'm saying that if the vision and our dream is for a world that's very different to the one that we live in, then we can't tinker within the system. It requires a much more radical project. And part of what I argued was that angels, by definition, cannot change the world in a radical way. We've got contributions to make to that project, but if you consider the history of INGOs as a compromise foundation. Mm -hmm. So I also spoke to the significant shifts and changes that are taking place right now, and I think that those represent moments of opportunities that we can step in, but it does require our vigilance. It does require conferences like this for us to step back make sense of the history and say what worked, what didn't, what do we need to do at this moment. So when you're talking about the history of INGOs, you mm. speak about the history of well-intentioned mm. Europeans, but how did it then materialize in the continent? Mm. Well, I think my understanding is that the initial INGO manifestations in our region was pure charity. It was about coming with school shoes, with books, with food, and so on. So as I'm saying, we can trivialize it, but that kept people alive, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It didn't change the system. And for a long time, that is exactly what NGOs did. Over the time, there's been a metamorphosis. It's changed our construction of development, and what that means has changed significantly. But the reality is that it's still within a particular framework, and that is why I'm saying Africans need to take charge of NGOs, INGOs, and radicalize in a way that disrupts the system, in a way that we have not been able to do thus far. But this is the big request, because the whole idea then is first what Ngugi Wathiongo speaks about is decolonizing mm -hmm. the mind. Mm -hmm. So you don't step into the system and perpetuate it. This has mm -hmm. been yeah. the problem throughout Africa, yeah. especially with the, you yeah. know, with the uh, yeah. independence of states, yeah. um, the, the yeah. so-called colonial government yeah. Left, but we had a perpetuation yeah. of the system. Yeah. So for me, this is exactly it's a much bigger debate than just African states or NGOs. It's how much revolution is possible through reform. So my understanding of how radical change happens is it's not possible to just launch into a revolution. That it's those small measures of reform, teaching someone to read, doesn't change the system, it doesn't disrupt it, but it plants a seed in someone that can potentially lead to something, which is one thing I don't take away from the work that NGOs do, because it's significant. It's the gaps that governments don't fill, it's a problematization of a discourse that we all love, that we are happy with, that, that very few of us voice uh, criticism about. So I think it's... It's a false binary to say either you're in the system or you're out. As someone who's operate a stride, that world, one foot in, one foot out, I know the benefit of it, but also that we have to be pragmatic about the landscape. We don't control this landscape. That foundation of slavery and then colonialism has set the framework in which we all operate. No one can step outside of that. So for us, the strategic question and the discussions that we're having inside is how do you operate within that framework without losing your revolutionary intent, without compromising yourself. And it's a very difficult oh, journey, yeah. which is why these it's spaces are... It's difficult to maneuver, isn't it? Yeah, no, because it's very difficult to lose yourself and sell out. You know, it's very easy to lose yourself and sell out in that process. But this is why these spaces are so important, because it's spaces of fortification where we can step back and say, <laughs> I'm not completely crazy. Uh, uh, these are things that I... I'm confused about too, and there are other comrades around the world, because I think this is what's so important in this moment of globalization. No one's struggle is unique. We all go around with a sense of exceptionalism, especially as South Africans, but the reality is there's a global framework of inequality, of exploitation that locks the South into a system of subjugation to the North, and it still prevails. It prevailed for a long time. Yes. So our experiences of oppression is as real as Somebody else's. Yeah, in another part of the world. And this is why this is so important, because when we talk to each other, we remind ourselves that our experience, for example, as women, it's not an accident. You know that women experience gender-based violence wherever we are in the world. It's the logical outcome of a very particular system. Mm -hmm. mm. We have to go to a break. When we come back, I just want to take up a particular narrative that has risen a lot in mm. South Africa, mm. and that is the missionary influence. Mm. And how has that impacted then mm. the development mm. of NGOs, mm. INGOs, mm. And, mm. and perhaps maybe perpetuating mm. the kind mm. of oppressions mm. that you speak about. But we'll raise this after the break. Mm. 
بمديح الهادي تنتظم ضاءت بالمختار ظلم وحلا في مولده النغم بمديح الهادي تنتظم ضاءت بالمختار ظلم وحلا في مولده النغم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me today in the ITV networks with a beautiful guest, Fatima Shabuddin. She's a feminist civil society activist. Fatima has done two masters, one um, in international peace studies from the University of Notre Dame and the other in development studies from the University of Sussex. Fatima, thank you once again for being here. And before we went on to the break, we were speaking about mm. this uh, dichotomy that lies mm. in INGOs and NGOs and the way in which they're shaping mm. a society mm. in Africa especially the question then is that you know if you look at as I said to you especially since uh, the, the decolonial struggle in South Africa with Facebook's fall uh, and then the, the new narrative on the block which is decolonization many of the students have complained about the shift um, on, on this collective memory the erasure of love of memory where there has been very little discussion about the missionary influence in Africa and what it has done. So on the one hand, yes, they built schools, they gave shoes, they gave clothing, etc. But on the other hand, there were very many other problematic issues related to it. And part of that, of course, relates to the fact that the, I think it's NKA Kerker, the Dutch Reform Church, that actually approved of, in a sense, apartheid, you know, and justified it. So do you find that this influence has crept into and existed throughout in, in the many, much of the work of the INGOs and the NGOs? The, the short answer is yes, but I do want to start off by recognizing the FISMAS 4 movement and I think the important work they've done in bringing colonialism and its consequences back into our lives. Because I think part of the illusion that we've suffered from is that it's in the past, apartheid is in the past, and what they've done very powerfully is reminded us actually you cannot walk away in this university and not know what colonialism is, not understand that it still lives with us. And so I do salute them. I know there's lots of criticism about the tactics. I have tactics. to say at this point, Tagbir, because yeah. yes, that's exactly think, what I did in yeah, class today yeah. too. Yeah. So for me, the, uh, bringing the conversation back to INGOs, it's not often spoken about because I think the INGO sector is embarrassed about it. But the reality is that the precursor to modern INGOs were missionary civilizing organizations, civilizing. So to understand that properly, we have to talk about what was colonialism, what was its intent. It was a civilizing project. It was about coming to Africa and saying, these savages, I have to teach them how to be civil. So that was the one objective. The other one was extractive, of course. They came to get our natural resources. And so if we read very carefully the history of those organizations, the relationships were very close. Mm -hmm. And then in a post-colonial period, where the state assumes a much bigger role in taking care of Africans, uh, those organizations retreat to the margins because there's not much for them to do. So it's not without irony that it's the introduction, the imposition of structural adjustment on our continent that sees a massive explosion of INGOs. Mm. Because the rationale of structural adjustment, the neoliberalism in essence is you make the state as small as possible and you tell poor people you're at the mercy of the market. Private medical aid will take care of you. If you want your kids to do well, send them to private That's school. Cool. The state is out of it completely. So you see in that immediate post-colonial period in the run-up to the enforcement of structural adjustment, the externalization of very central state functions and who was there to pick it up? It was INGOs because these very organizations, the Bretton Woods, the World Bank, the IMF, the difference were telling us, no, make your civil service as strong as, as, strong as possible, and don't worry, there will be organizations. So if you track the funding flows, if you look at OECD studies, there's just a massive expansion of the amount of money that goes back to the north in the name of the south. And of course, the particular model of INGOism at the time was you send white people from the north to save these people from this trail. So if you look at the profile of what an INGO is at the time, usually it's a white man from London mm -hmm. who is here running programs, saving Africans from themselves, but actually bypassing Africans in the process. So in that very process, we become marginalized, right? So that's not very complicated. I think what caught us off guard is the reinvention because at some point, the penny drops for, I think the penny drops for Africans on day one, that the structural adjustment program is not about us, it's not about our interests, but it takes a very long time for us to win the ideological battle where the Bretton Woods Institution are eventually reluctantly willing to say, actually that is true, there's something wrong with this. 
some of them are still resisting, acknowledging that to be true. But I think we've won that battle. The statistics, the development indicators tell the story very painfully that it didn't work and it fact left us off in a much worse state. I've actually just been teaching a particular paper on the ethics of the IMF. Mm -hmm. And then the, the individual person who wrote this is actually an ex-employee of the IMF. Mm -hmm. And he also outlines mm -hmm. how at so many times where they made it clear and apparent to the IMF that, you know, what, by advising this particular policy, you're going to impoverish the people mm -hmm. further, or you're going to trap them into greater debt, and yet the IMF went ahead and did these things. So, as you say, the continuation of the impoverishment is not only from some colonial, but the, the structures post-colonial as well. Do you find that there is a general lack of ethics in, in, in civil society, just as there is a lack of ethics in state? It's a, it's a difficult one to answer because most of the people that I've encountered in civil society genuinely are there guided by good hearts. It's people who want to change the world in some way. And I think that's what drew me there too. I was an activist in the 80s and moving into the NGO sector was almost a natural extension of that expression. So I don't know. I don't think there's an act of manipulation. There's not a. There's not an attempt to say, forget about the poor people. We're going to do things in the way that we want to. But people have developed a certain muscle of doing things in a certain way for a very long time. As I'm saying, we're talking about the hundred-year line. So I don't think there's the kind of like the denial, denial of what has happened. As they are, for example, in the World Bank, it took them very long to admit that they knew what they were doing. That people in their ranks were telling us there's something fundamentally wrong with what you're doing. Whereas I think in the INGO sector, there was a much more gradual interrogation with processes and impact, you know, the consequence of the work. So I don't find, I, I, I think I would be uncomfortable saying that that was my encounter. But of course, it doesn't detract from the consequences of the work of the organization. Um, a, a big problem with rec in terms of recognition mm. of INGOs has been this narrative that many of the aid organizations or the NGOs that come in actually come in with the intention of regime change. Mm -hmm. So they come in with a political agenda mm. carrying a charitable mm. face. Mm. Did you find that in your work? Look, it's very really difficult to know. No, uh Fund or put regime change in their country, no, right? Course, so they come to us and they say, "This is the money that they have available." Whether it's women's rights or civil society uh, mobilization, if that coincides with our agendas, of course we take the money because the question is, where else are we going to get the resources from to fund our work? So in a country like South Africa, a middle-income country that's extremely unequal, there's lots of money here. Try and find money to do radical change in the country, nothing. You can find money for food gardens, you can find money for school shoes, maybe you can find money for sanitary towels now, but you can't find money to fight patriarchy. You can't find money for a radical land reform program, for example. Mm -hmm. So we must also recognize that the limitations on money is as much from the north as it is in our own countries, because the people who have money are the people who benefited from the system, for whom the system works. Yes, exactly. So a big part of shifting the NGO sector the dynamic and the prevailing development ideology comes back to where the money comes from, who makes decisions about that money and what it's used for. So ultimately it's follow the money trail. Eh? It is. The money is very important, but I know of many organizations who have been able to creatively step outside of that mm -hmm. framework. So one of the things that I've argued in the conference is that part of what we need to do is, number one, as NGOs acknowledge that colonial history, tell it, don't be ashamed of it. None of us are beholden to where we come from. We get to, we have a voice in where we're taking organizations for our own futures. The other part of it is just the honest recognition that NGOs have never, nowhere in the history of the universe, have we been able to affect radical change. If you look at slavery, if you look at the end of colonialism, if you look at the end of apartheid, in our current moment of confronting, beginning to confront a pat a patriarchy, NGOs have always played a very important supportive role in the process, but it's social movements that change yes. the world. So my challenge to NGOs, to my organization, to anyone else is to say, show me the evidence that the work of the NGO holds movements in some way. Otherwise, we all we do is have conferences, maybe we go to court now and then, but and that is what locks us into that funders paradigm because social movements also have more fluidity, more dynamism. They're not as locked into a donor contract as an NGO is. So I do think we must recognize the limitations of our own abilities and NGOs are very reluctant to do that um, because the other 
challenge around NGOs, of course, is now the face of NGOs has changed. It's not white men from London anymore, it's people like me. <laughs> but it doesn't make a difference whether your NGO is led by a black woman or a white man if we're reproducing the old frameworks and the old ideologies. So I think there's more onus on people like me with the lived experience of living in South Africa to introduce a new ideology and a way of working. But the reality is that these things have also way of reproducing itself. So if you look at who's in INGOs now, it may be Africans, but it's the elite. You know, to aid an INGO, in, I need to be a graduate. I need to be able to uh, have a uh, interview fluently on in Kiwi exactly. English. The way you present I yourself. need to know how to write, to write log from. So it's not a representation of marginalized and poor community. It is a representation of the elite in this context. So ultimately, again, it's a paternalistic approach to yeah. how, how you treat the society yeah. or, the, or all well, the country that you do. Yeah, I think the nature of NGOs that is that it reproduces elites, which is why I'm saying the only check and balance to that is to build the movement of the poor. We're not going to change conditions in South Africa for women until we have a movement of working class black women in South Africa, it doesn't matter how many women's rights NGOs we have. Mm. That doesn't change the world. It's about taking ownership, but it's, mm. a, it's a difficult power struggle mm. that you're Absolutely. holding for. Yeah. And I'm sure at the same time it must be very frustrating and debilitating for you when you come against those blocks, right? Yeah. The obstacles are huge. Yeah. Look, I've been in the sector for more than 20 years and I know that there's been enough victories along the way for me to be inspired to keep going. And I think that is really the challenge to all of us to understand that the change that we're dreaming of is so radical, we probably won't see it in our lifetimes. And our contribution is to shift the earth in a certain direction. And if we close our eyes on this earth and we think we've moved it a little bit, that should be our achievement. But we can't sit down when we encounter obstacles because I think we have an obligation to keep going We're regardless of... to social justice because yeah. ultimately it's about the dignity of humans, right? Absolutely. Yeah, but thank yeah. you very much for sharing my these pleasure, ideas we at the pleasure. end. And I'm sure that you will inspire the young people to start thinking about new ways because it's also about thinking of new ways around development too, Absolutely. Right? Okay. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Okay. Okay. Okay.